Welcome to Onco Daily. We are today honored to introduce Dr. Navneet Singh, a distinguished figure in the field of thoracic medical oncology. Dr. Singh holds a professorship in pulmonology and serves as the faculty in charge at the Lung Cancer Clinic of the esteemed postgraduate institute of medical education and research in Chandigarh, India. His expertise and research are deeply rooted in thoracic oncology with a particular focus on innovative treatments such as targeted therapies and immunotherapy for combating non-small cell lung cancer. His contributions to the medical science are vast, with over 200 publications in peer-reviewed medical journals, numerous book chapters to his name, and a significant impact on the global medical community through his involvement with International Association of the Study of Lung Cancer's Publications Committee for two successive terms. He is a past recipient of the prestigious award and fellowship, including the International Development and Education Award, IDEA, from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, the AACR LCI International Investigator Operating Grant and Palliative Care Fellowship from the European Society of Medical Oncology, ESMO. He was also recently conferred the ISLC Clifton Mountain Lectureship Award for staging at the 2023 World Conference of Lung Cancer at Singapore. Dr. Singh, I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure, pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so what inspired you to focus on your career on mainly lung cancer research and innovation in this field? Uh, so when uh, I was in the process of completing my fellowship, which was uh, almost 16, 17 years back, uh, there was an unmet need for streamlining the services of the lung cancer clinic which has historically been uh, run by our department, the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Institute where I work, which is the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, which is North of India. It's an apex referral center. And so we get patients from uh, several neighboring states. So uh, as soon as I finished my fellowship uh, and I joined as a faculty, uh, I got involved with the lung cancer clinic and one of my first steps was uh, uh, streamlining its working, uh, reinventing the chemotherapy protocol so that they were in line with what is internationally followed and yet uh, took into account the local geographical and the demographic factors and uh, improving the recording, data recording process, data extraction process. And then it just was from one step to the another. Gotcha. And throughout your career, you, you didn't only practice thoracic oncology or the pulmonary. You, you, you made a change. You made a difference. And like you had almost more than 200 uh, like or 250 publications. Uh, how did you achieve that? Yeah, so it's, even I don't have the exact count right now, but it is above 200, 200 maybe close to 250. Mm -hmm. uh, so what initially, obviously, the publications were small, starting with the reading uh, original articles and then writing letters to the editor or correspondence, uh, moved on and then started case reports. And I, I think that's the normal trajectory for when you go from training to uh, full-time faculty appointment, and then obviously brief reports, case series, and ultimately original articles, and ultimately culminating in writing editorials and being the lead author for uh, international guidelines like uh, the ones from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, I, I mean, that, that was really the pinnacle of uh, having worked in this field, being co-chair for ASCO's uh, stage four living guideline, as well as for stage three NSCLC management. And um, have you had any mentors in the pathway, anyone who guided you, or did you have to figure out the pathway on your own? So uh, my first award uh, was uh, ASCO's International Development and Education Award. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was very early on in my uh, academic career as a faculty appointment. And uh, I was uh, paired with somebody who is very well known throughout the world, 
Dr. Lawrence Einhorn or Larry Einhorn as he is called. Mm -hmm. And he is my first mentor mm -hmm. and I believe also my strongest mentor. We are still in touch after all of these years. And in fact, uh, even uh, last month uh, when I was at uh, a meeting, we uh, met each other and he remarked that he's been truly happy and proud of what I have accomplished. So having a good mentor is very, very important. Uh, he, he has always been there to support me, uh, has been able to help out anytime I have had issues. But apart from him, there have been several mentors uh, outside my country who have, <clears throat> whom I have reached out anytime I have had issues with uh, uh, difficult cases or uh, scenarios where I needed help. Gotcha. So you believe like in the power of mentorship, it's easier to figure out the way when you have someone guiding you than doing it all up on your own. Yes, definitely. It, it helps. And obviously, uh, one has to be uh, doing self-learning all the time. I mean, reading the latest research, which gets published in journals, uh, staying abreast of what is happening. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when, when you are well-read, you can apply that knowledge in the clinic for the benefit of patients. But time to time, everybody, all clinicians face challenging cases. And therefore, it's always good to be able to reach out to somebody uh, whom you believe has had a much greater experience in all of that. And the advice they give has been um, very, very useful, both for my understanding as well as for ultimately patient care. And uh, I have uh, both you may call friends or senior colleagues or mentors whom I have reached out multiple times and have helped me uh, for whatever advice I wanted. And also like beyond publications and uh, the, the, the beyond publishing, you, you talked about the award and I, I want to touch base more on it. Like you've been awarded like international awards. Like uh, what do you think is the secret? Like, let's say I am an oncologist early in my training and uh, I look at you and see all the awards. Like, how can I achieve this uh, in my career? Well, um, I, I think the simplest thing is that uh, you should be dedicated in what you are doing. Be focused in uh, the area that really appeals to you. Keep on doing it and awards typically follow. <laughs> so you, are, you don't have to run after awards. Awards will run after you. Um, can we switch gears a bit about to talk about the state of oncology in India? Um, do you think that people have the appropriate access to chemotherapies and immunotherapies in India, or there is shortage in some parts of the country? So uh, this can be addressed in two different ways. For chemotherapy, there are no issues. Uh, for the very simple reason that almost all of these drugs are manufactured by multiple Indian companies mm -hmm. and are uh, pretty much uh, easy to afford. In fact, <clears throat> there is also a, a national level scheme by the government of India, which is the uh, called the Ayushman Bharat scheme or um, the prime minister's fund. And that covers almost all of the chemotherapy regimens. Mm -hmm. So access to chemotherapy is not an issue at all. However, if you talk of targeted therapies, well, there are issues. For the most common oncogenic driver alteration, which is EGFR in our setting, and which is to the prevalence of approximately 30%, again, the first generation and uh, the, one of the second generation drugs, basically Jefitinib, Arlotinib, and Afatinib, they are manufactured by multiple Indian uh, companies, mm -hmm. uh, cost, uh, from a cost perspective, they are affordable and they're also covered under the same uh, government scheme, which I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you talk of uh, the third generation EGFR drug or you talk of the other targeted drugs, they uh, are manufactured usually only by uh, one company, which is the innovator. And their pricing is also much, much more than what you have for the ones which are made locally within the country. Some of the drugs are also not marketed. So for them, uh, having access can be an issue uh, for from two aspects. One is they are marketed, 
but the price is so much that most patients cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. And the second scenario is that they are not yet even marketed within the country. Mm -hmm. And obviously for some of them, you may have, you can try for uh, getting these drugs for patients via the compassionate access programs of the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, obviously it's not as easy a task as for the ones which are locally made and locally available. Even for the immune checkpoint inhibitors, all of these drugs are made only by the innovator companies and um, are very, you know, very expensive. And therefore, only a small fraction of patients who are eligible would actually be able to afford the drugs. Gotcha. And like when we talk about affordability, um, how is the uh, Indian healthcare marketplace? Is it like... Uh, paid is the healthcare sponsored or paid by the government or is it insurance companies or is it a cash marketplace or is it a mix of three so it's it's a it's a very heterogeneous scenario so as i was saying that uh, for people who fall in a certain uh, socioeconomic bracket uh, which is uh, typically the lower socioeconomic bracket they are covered by the uh, federal or the central government uh, scheme Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the there is also a certain percentage of patients who have access to health insurance and will get uh, reimbursed from their respective insurance companies then there is uh, another small percentage of uh, patients who are working in organizations whether they are governmental or non-governmental and get reimbursed from their respective organizations and not directly from insurance Mm -hmm. And then there is a big, uh, huge um, proportion of patients who will typically end up paying from their own savings, or as you may call it, from uh, cash paying patients. So it's it's a completely heterogeneous scenario. And even for uh, the place where they go for a seeking treatment, it varies from going to the private or the corporate hospitals mm -hmm. to the government uh, funded uh, healthcare facilities. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, what is the state of uh, lung cancer research in India? Um, where do you think India stands when it comes to the research in the field and uh, helping in crafting the guidelines? So uh, in the recent past, I think the uh, research scenario has improved quite a bit. You now have... Uh, important papers coming out of the uh, well-known reputed uh, cancer centers, whether that's the Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, or uh, institute like ours, which is uh, PGI, MER. Uh, one area which still needs a lot of improvement is the um, access to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So, India has historically been underrepresentative in the global clinical trials. Gotcha. And uh, although the, um, the manufacturers or the companies which are doing these trials now have that realization and they are making an attempt to include India as sites for uh, global phase three trials and also include Indian patients, but there is still a long way to go. And therefore, I think it would really help patients if, all of these uh, companies, when they do these phase two and phase three trials, give weightage to India in terms of the population and not just uh, having a name that this country was representative because what has been observed is that, for example, if you have uh, 200 patients being enrolled in a global phase three trial, mm -hmm. the number of patients which are allocated for enrollment in India would be in single digits or sometimes 10, 15, which is not in line with the population and the percentage of population, uh, of global population, which the country has. So that is one thing which they should improve. And do you think it's the, uh, what I'm hearing is I feel like it's more like the, the companies in this space, they are they are the ones who are not um, including enough percentage or number of Indian patients. Is that the situation? 
Yes, so the numbers are definitely lower. So either India would not be represented in these trials or the number of patients allocated per trial would be much lower than what one would expect. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, they may, this may in part also be due to the uh, time difference it takes for various regulatory approvals from country to country. Uh, but I, I think a lot of those things have changed, have improved in the recent past. And maybe if there is enough effort, uh, the situation could improve further. Gotcha. And you mentioned the conversation earlier that there is like, um, th th there are, th there is heterogeneity um, in how the Indian healthcare marketplace uh, is, is paid or like the transactions happen. Uh, like, what do you think are the, uh, the the reasons or the challenges of different types of access or lower access in certain population in India to cancer care. So I, I think that's very important. So the people people living in big cities, the metro cities as we call them, Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, Bangalore. So they have access to uh, the big hospitals where all of these facilities are available. But people who are living in either remote geographical areas, hilly locations, or far away from cities, they often need to travel significant uh, distances in order to uh, access healthcare, especially state-of-the-art uh, uh, treatment facilities. And uh, empowering, uh, I think, uh, district-level hospitals or smaller centers uh, to be able to diagnose cancer early and make early referrals or even do uh, the initial part of the treatment would go a long way. One of the important things, especially in the context of uh, tuberculosis, which I may put in, is the endemicity of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it is not uncommon for us to see that patients who ultimately get diagnosed with lung cancer have been empirically treated with anti-tubercular therapy simply because they presented with pulmonary symptoms and had some oh, wow. abnormalities on chest radiographs, which the treating clinician uh, initially thought was tuberculosis and just started on tuberculosis treatment. And when there was no response, further evaluation was done and ultimately lung cancer got diagnosed. So that, that is one thing which uh, we believe that uh, educating both the population uh, as well as the health primary healthcare providers could make a difference in improving the uh, stage at which lung cancer gets diagnosed mm -hmm. and thereby improve outcomes. Gotcha. Sweet. Thank you so much. Those were my questions. And that was very enlightening to understand um, tips and tricks about success in academic oncology and uh, how the practice of oncology is shaped in India. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, doing this and inviting me over. Thank you.